This episode of Geared Up is brought to you by National Car Rental. Take control of your travel experience with National Car Rental's Emerald Club. Visit nationalcar.com to find out more. There's a lot of people who I've seen, especially like if they're older, they don't want to get rid of their home button. They're holding on to their phones because they might want a new phone, but they don't want to learn new gestures and a new interface. And so here's an opportunity to get new specs, faster phone, better camera and all this while still maintaining that comfort level. I don't think you're wrong. I mean, I can give a personal example. My dad was holding onto his iPhone success for dear life because he did not want to get rid of his home button. Oh, really? He just didn't want anything new. I had an older iPhone 10 and I was like, listen, you can buy yourself a new phone and pay for it yourself or you can have an iPhone 10 that I will just give you. And he's like, well, okay, I'll take a free phone. Uh, <laughs> so he used it and now he loves Face ID. He's like, I don't think about it anymore. Yeah. And his thumbprint very rarely worked with, with Touch ID. So he's always putting in his passcode. So maybe it's an instance that people just need to try it. And there's a longer discussion about the generational life of iPhone. So the first mm-hmm. life that it has from the first owner, second and third life these phones have when they get sort of traded back into Apple and they go to emerging markets. Right. And that sort of keeps this alive a lot longer. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am John Rettinger. Geared Up is your weekly look at the world of consumer electronics and gadgets. And over the last few weeks, we've also been the show you come to to continue the saga of John Rettinger and his move from iOS over to Android. Yes. We're coming up on a month now. Oh, wow. Since I, I green bubbled myself and i have tried and i've used a myriad of android phones started with the galaxy s10 plus moved over to the pixel Uh 4 xl for a little while from there went to the galaxy z flip and Mm. i've been alternating my sim card between a i caved and i bought one a used galaxy fold and the s20 ultra both of which came in yesterday you're just over here swapping phones non-stop and I think that's part of the beauty of like this Android switch is like usually when I was on iOS, I'd like, do I want the big one or the small one? Right. And then what color of big one or small one? But the experience mm-hmm. was the same. You know, I went from Pixel to now having foldable phones. It's been a lot of fun. I'm already very far over and past the like, oh, no, what am I going to do with like stuff I'm missing and I don't have everything? I now feel like pretty ensconced in the Android world. And I'm enjoying it. And I really like having the flexibility to try new things. And I haven't really missed much from the iOS world. I do want to share just a couple bits of things that I've learned since switching over to Android for folks who might be considering the same. Yes. Uh, Some of the things that I really thought that I was going to miss and then there was no way around was AirDrop. And then the shared photo galleries on iOS because my 90 year old grandparents are on iPhone and there's no way they could learn Google Photos. So I was kind of missing out on that. And I've kind of found solutions for both of them. Okay. Which has been awesome. So Samsung's got a version of AirDrop, but it only works from Samsung to Samsung. But there's a website Mm. which I didn't know even existed and it's called snapdrop.net. And you can do it from your phone's browser your computer's browser, it's OS agnostic, iOS, Mac, Windows, Android, whatever. And it creates an ad hoc Wi-Fi network and it lets you essentially airdrop whatever files you want. What? It's not as fast as airdrop. And if you want to send multiple files, you have to sort of accept each one individually on the receiving phone. Mm -hmm. But it works and has been amazing and made me not miss airdrop at all. So that's been a really pleasant surprise. Both sides have to be in the browser on this website for this to work. Correct. Is that correct? So both okay. sites have to be on that. And for you know the Android phone or even on an iPhone and Safari, I just created a shortcut on my desktop or a shortcut on my home screen. Okay. So wow. it behaves just like an app. It was called snapdrop.net. Not a sponsor or anything, just a service that I found to be really helpful. And I know there's some concern about whether or not they can, you know, store giving information to a third party website. I did a bit of research on this company and they actually give you full server side access to what their servers are doing. One of the only companies I can see that do that. There is no personal information at all being shared on their servers. It's just device to device. It's just sort of building that bridge. And what crosses the bridge, their servers never see. So that's been awesome. And I assume completely free. Totally free. Okay. Although I would probably happily pay for it. Yeah. And then sharing photos, I'm still using an iPad. So when I go to bed at night, any pictures that I took, I open up Google Photos on my iPad, select them, 
saved to device on my iPad, which puts them into Apple Photos, and I'm sharing mm. out my photos that way to my grandparents. So I'm okay. still being able to do that without having to be on an iPhone. So just one quick extra step. Yeah. Aside from that, I'm digging Android life. Telegram I'm sort of using to replace iMessage. It's been amazing, and I've enjoyed Android, but I am absolutely in love with the Galaxy Fold. Like the in used love in Galaxy in love. Fold, which surprised me. What's up? The used Galaxy Fold. You actually bought I, one. I you, did. You took the risk. It's the first phone I've bought used, actually. <laughs> Ever. Usually phones get sent to us, so I've never really had to buy a used phone. I bought it from Swappa. Uh, I kind of took a chance. It's sort of insured and backed by you know PayPal security. Yep. And it's been awesome. It's been so much fun. It looks brand new, like completely brand new. Is this the phone that you've been using most recently as your main device? Yeah, I mean, it just came in yesterday. So since okay. yesterday, okay. I've been using it as a main device. And I've okay. got the S20 Ultra all set up that I'm sort of, I'm also looking at. That one came with the SIM card. So yeah. I'll eventually switch over to the S20 Ultra for more testing. But the Fold is awesome. And I think what's exciting about the Fold is what's going to come next, right? It's a Gen, very clearly a Gen 1 device, right? Yeah, it's or, not for or everybody. 0. It's 0.5, in my opinion. Yeah. My personal opinion. It's expensive, mm -hmm. but Max Weinbach, kind of the boy genius who pretty much liked everything about the S20 and the Z Flip, kind of came out swinging with some word on the Galaxy Fold successor. Okay. Which Galaxy I think Fold is 2, the successor. Galaxy Fold 2, which I think is extra exciting. So, first thing, and probably to the surprise of nobody, have sort of edge to edge screen on the outside. You know, uh -huh. one of the knock think on the Galaxy Folds, the screen right. is. It's weird, right? It's a weird mini screen mm -hmm. edge to edge, which will be certainly pretty awesome. It'll have allegedly close to an eight inch display, which is awesome. When you unfold it, the same camera setup that we see in the S20 plus. So baller camera, incredible mm -hmm. optical zoom, just really good. 5G, 108 megapixel on one of those sensors, Snapdragon 865, 5G and S Pen support, plus that ultra thin glass that we've seen on the Z Flip. Right. So, so hot this damn, becomes right? a phone that, for all intents and purposes, will likely be announced alongside the Note, the Note 20, Correct. and will be more akin to a larger Note device due to the fact that it would have an S Pen with yes, it. Yes, that is true. That and, makes uh, a lot of sense. All of these specs, though, this thing's probably going to cost like $9,000. <laughs> and you'll be, you'll be right there for it, though. You know, before I was like, ah, I don't want to spend the money for the fold. After using the fold, I see it. I get it. I love it. And I am so excited for Gen 2. Man, you're all about this. I have to say the original fold, I felt so many compromises with it that, you know, even as someone who considers himself an early adopter sure. um, and fan and all this, I just felt like there's too many compromises here, especially when I fold it. Like when I fold it closed, it's so bulky and the gap is so large that it, it just felt inconvenient. But obviously the best part of the fold, and I'm assuming you'll agree, is opening it up and having what's essentially, it's a tablet. It's not, yeah. I don't even oh, yeah. consider it a folding phone. This is a folding tablet. The Z Flip is a folding phone. The fold is a folding tablet. And being able to have yeah. a tablet sized device, an iPad mini sized device, if you will, in your pocket I mean, you just can't get that anywhere else. No, it's amazing. And yeah, there certainly are flaws with the original Fold. Absolutely. But I think those flaws, same thing to learn from. And until you get to that mass adopted device, you have to have these early gens, right? Like you just, you have to have them. I don't know. I mean, again, my personal opinion, I think the Fold 2 that you just described, that's rumored for this year. That could have easily been the first public fold. And this could have just the first one could have been, you know, they, you need to do some stuff in R&D. Like I'm sure, for example, other companies like Apple or Microsoft, where they're also working on foldable displays, foldable devices, but they're not putting them out yet. And Apple's the kind of company that we know isn't going to put it out until they're not going to put out and would not have put out the original fold. They would have waited until it was more mature so that people weren't buying it and saying, you know what, there's a lot of things about this that. I don't like, I mean, it's still cool, but there's a lot about it that's half baked. So I just think Samsung is the kind of company that's like, hey, we just got to get stuff out there. I disagree with a lot of that statement. I do agree with the Samsung saying they got to get things out there. And I think it's foolish to think that Apple or any other company who hasn't yet entered the foldable market isn't learning from what Samsung is doing with sure. the Gen 1 fold. 
Absolutely. And Samsung themselves had to go through the manufacturing process, the mass manufacturing process to figure out problems and flaws that perhaps couldn't have been figured out if they just waited a year and launched maybe a a second gen. Mm -hmm. I still believe that the Fold is very clearly a developer device that's not meant for everybody, but a company who's developing devices out in the open and appears to take feedback they get from it to heart and consumers who are spending $2,000, I believe, know what they're getting. It's, a, it's an educated subset of people who are going to spend that amount of money are generally aware of the phone that they're receiving in return. Hope so. I don't think we get to a Gen 2, at least a Gen 2 like it looks like we're going to get without maybe the lumps and bumps that it took to get there. Speaking of a Gen 2. Yes. We have, in a way, Samsung has just released a product that they obviously, they developed it with the learning that they got from the Galaxy Fold, which we oh, yeah. just picked up. And that is the Galaxy Z Flip. Correct. Announced during Unpacked. The biggest surprise to a lot of people was the fact that while the S20 would be released on March 6th, the Galaxy Z Flip foldable phone would be released three days later after the event, which is yeah. a week ago. So this phone has been out for a week for the general public to purchase. Galaxy Z Flip, foldable. We both have it. We've both been using it. How do you feel about that one? So you know, the Z Flip was supposed to come out months ago. Yeah. Relatively soon after the original Fold. And after the Fold had its issues, they kind of retooled it. So you are kind of getting a Gen 2, at least a Gen 2 on the hinge front, right? With those little bristles and stuff in there. Yeah. Again, I'm an early adopter. Maybe I can just see the wonder in foldable devices. I've really enjoyed using the Z Flip. I used it as my only phone for a week thus far mm-hmm. before I switched over to the Fold. And I didn't find many sacrifices that I was making. I didn't mind the crease. I didn't mind the polymer layer on top of the glass. Battery life for me got much better day over day to where I usually could get through that full day. Uh Performance was great. The hinge was solid. I liked that it gave you different use cases for opening it up for video calls and photos. There's not much additional you get with the foldable form factor of that nature, aside from a smaller footprint in your pocket. Yeah, but it was very neat and the novelty didn't wear off, at least after the first week. So what did what did you think? I'm a little bit. I think you and I are on the opposite end when it comes to foldables. it appears that way when it comes to foldables. And I want to make clear that this is not an iOS versus Android feeling or opinion. This is strictly on the foldable portion. When I saw it announced and when I got my hands on it, I was like, this is really cool. The screen technology to do this is amazing. If it's really glass, this is amazing. And then I got the unit in. And for me, what I would say, the easiest way for me to describe it is exactly how you ended your thoughts, which was the novelty wore off fairly quickly for me. And what I found was the moments that I thought the Z Flip was the most cool was during the process of folding or unfolding the phone. So anytime I was folding it or unfolding it or folding it halfway, like playing with that hinge, I'm thinking this is incredible. Look at this display, look at it, you know, look at it curve, look at it turn. But for me, when you take the Z flip out of your pocket and you unfold it into full smartphone mode, the second you're done doing that, it just becomes a worse phone in my opinion and more expensive phone in my opinion than everything else Samsung announced. So it has this cool factor to it, but there's not a lot of utility. I think the like the legit utility is being able to prop up the phone for video calls, for selfies, like doing that kind of stuff. That's a valid utility. Folding or unfolding it halfway and having half the screen like move up so you can watch YouTube videos on the top half and read comments on the bottom, not a lot of utility there. And so it seems hard for me to recommend even to early adopters to spend $1,380 on this phone. That's the retail price. When for all intents and purposes, you're going to be using this phone completely unfolded, 180 degrees flat unfolded for the majority of the time when you're using it. That makes it similar to every other smartphone out there. Sure. They just don't fold. You're going to get better phones for less money And the only time you're really taking advantage of what you're paying for is during the process of a fold or unfold for, you know, one to two seconds. I mean, that's an interesting point. And I think they can you can definitely make that argument that there isn't utility there. I think that if perhaps the exterior screen was larger, yes, give you more notification room. Absolutely. You would perhaps have more utility if it had a screen like the Razer, for example. Yes. uh, Yeah, 100 percent. 
I think it might be a different level discussion. Mm -hmm. I agree. But the same thing, I don't think you can say sort of foldables and good value in the same sentence. If you want good value for your phone (laughs) buying buck, a foldable is not the way to go. People who are spending the money, spending $1,400 for a phone, that novelty of the fold and unfold is is worth it to them. Or at least they think it's worth worth it to them. That's what they're paying for is that novelty. Exactly. Is what I'm saying. Like you're getting a, you're basically getting a 2019 smartphone as specs wise. You're getting an S10. Right. You're getting, like you said, this phone should have come out and was going to come out a while ago. So you're getting a 2019 device at higher than 2020 typical prices at a time when what I consider to be, and you tell me if you agree with this, I consider the S20 to basically be a new generation of smartphone and not year over year generation, but like a legit, we get a new like generation of phone every four or five years. And this is like this year, 2020, we're seeing these phones, you know, 8k 5g all, you know, through and through amazing high resolution cameras, like things like that, a 40 megapixel front camera, for example, like we're seeing a lot, huge batteries this year, 2020 is the year where, the specs are taking a huge leap forward. And I feel the timing on this phone, which is being sold, I I really feel just being sold on novelty. I feel like people will be disappointed in their purchase after a few months. If you're spending a lot of money on this phone with the expectation that this is gonna be your phone for the next, you know, two or three years. Sure, I can agree with that. But for you. Yeah, or us, right? Yeah, even well, even us. Yeah. But for you in particular, though, it seems like you you said the novelty hasn't worn out. You obviously you like the fold. You like the Z flip. What is it about? So if you were let's take review units out of this. So actually, you purchased okay. you purchased. The I, fold. Did. I, um, I did. I I bought this. Did you I buy bought the Z- phone with my with my own money? And the Z flip you bought that, that as well. Correct. Did okay. you get a review unit for longer than 24 hours? No, 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 no. (laughs) That's a whole nother thing. Like if a phone is launching in three days, then that means there is inventory out there that you can give reviewers sooner access than the day of release and only giving it to them for 24 hours. It seems kind of fishy. Like, what do you not want us to find that you're going to give something on a Friday and need it back on Saturday? I think it was just an inventory constraint. I don't think it was uh, trying to hide something. I think something would come out anyway. I think it was just an inventory issue. Yeah. In my opinion. Okay. So you bought these phones, your own money, both of these phones. You are still, you, you haven't felt what I felt. You like this stuff. Is there something, is it just the cool factor or have you actually found? And I think it's a lot easier to find the utility in the galaxy fold, by the way. Sure. But in the Z flip in particular, are you finding utility with the fold? So let me me rephrase it for you. So we review phones or I review a lot of phones. There are 12 months in a year. I'm generally reviewing one to two phones a month. So say between 20 and 25 phones that I review yeah. every year. And certainly many, many more come out. They are all various versions of the same thing. On the Android side, the flagship Android phones, they're not really flagship features of Samsung or flagship features of Google or LG. They're flagship features from Qualcomm, right. from the processor. So you can look at every phone coming out in 2020, it has a Snapdragon 865 and say it's going to do 8K. Mm-hmm. It'll have a much faster ultrasonic fingerprint reader. I mean, you can run down the spec sheet and most of that comes from Qualcomm. So there isn't that yes. much of a difference with every phone that's going to come out this year and every phone that came out last year and the year before. They're all similar looking slabs. I agree. I get very excited by foldables and certainly they are nowhere mainstream devices, but because it is something different. And I love when companies take these risks, even if they're mm-hmm. high price risks and try new things. And I'm more tolerant of the shortcomings, not blind to them but more tolerant of the shortcomings for the sake of newness okay. to get to that next thing. Progress. For progress. And I think you yeah. have to go through these small steps to get there. So I think that's why I have a soft spot for foldables. and Why I want, kind of want to show my support, both financially, but also publicly for these devices by spending money. I mean, each device, I bought my fold for about 1400 bucks and I bought my Z Flip for 1400 bucks. I spent $2,800 mm-hmm. on foldable phones, an insane amount of money. More than anybody should spend on foldable phones. Certainly it's it's for the content I'm going to generate from them, but I put my money where my mouth is. And that's the best endorsement that I can give is that I believe in something new. Yeah. And I want to experience it 
And by the time we get to generation four or five, these are amazing. I want the perspective of where we started from. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this before we take our break. Okay. I feel, and I think most people would agree with this, but I feel that the more interesting stuff from a software and user perspective, and I think as I'm saying this sentence, it's kind of hitting me. I'm more of a software person than a hardware person. I want to see what the software is going to enable me to do rather than how cool the hardware is going to be. I feel that there's more innovation happening with things like what LG is doing with dual screen. So it folds, but it doesn't, the screen doesn't fold. It like it hinges kind of like a laptop. Yeah. The dual screen thing. So the dual screen or what Microsoft's doing with the, the surface duo that's coming up and how you can see the software interacting on two screens rather than a fold one screen folding seeing how a dual screen device can make things either more fun or easier to use. How do you see the difference between a foldable, which is obviously progress in in hardware Mm -hmm. and the progress in software that we're seeing on the dual screen mobile devices? You know, I've only tested what now I think two of the dual screen type phones and fairness. I haven't used that many. So It's nice. It's another use of technology, which is progress, right? It's not foldable, but you get the benefits, perhaps, of foldable without the shortcomings. I think it is interesting. And I think software does solve a lot of hardware problems, but it's something, it's a form factor we've seen for a long time, right? We've seen it on, you know, we've seen it on phones for years. Maybe it's just becoming better now. It's interesting. I'm not as excited by it, though, as I am the actual folding displays. Hmm, See, that, that interests me. Very interesting. Hey, two different opinions on the future of tech and devices and it's cool like i like the fact that we can have a discussion and be on like opposite sides because i've gained some insight a little bit of insight from what you shared and i'm sure same for you you probably have too that's absolutely same from what you've shared if you're listening we want to hear from you as well hit us up on twitter let us know your opinion or drop a comment down below let us know your opinion on foldables, foldable screens, foldable devices with dual screens. We're curious what our audience thinks. Up next, John and I both have been using the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra. We've got them in. We have have thoughts on the next major smartphone to launch. That's coming up next on Geared Up. Big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring this week's episode of Geared Up. Travel tech can make you a master road warrior. You know what else puts you in control of your business trip? National Car Rentals Emerald Club. You can bypass the counter, choose any car on the aisle, and go. It feels good to be in the driver's seat, doesn't it? Go national, go like a pro. Subject to availability and other restrictions. Welcome back to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. As you know, Geared Up is sponsored by National Car Rental. And if you don't know, I also do a show with National Car Rental on YouTube called Technically Speaking, where I bring you the latest, my picks for the best tech for business travel. Whether you're business traveling or even whether you're going for leisure travel, there's a lot of tech out there that can make your travel more efficient or even more fun. You can check these episodes out at the nationalcar.com control center or go to youtube.com slash national car rent. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. Once again, big thank you and shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. All right, John, up next, let's talk about the new devices that we received. If you were on Twitter or Instagram yesterday, you probably saw if you follow personalities like John and I or others, a lot of us received our Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra review units. Yes, so we did. For about 24 hours now. And obviously we played with them at the events and we had pre-briefings, but now we actually have them in our hands without Samsung kind of looking over our shoulder as we're playing with these devices. Let's talk about, let's talk about some of this stuff. The one thing that stuck out to me was the 8K video. Did you test any of this recording in 8K? So I've been testing really heavily the stills, but I have not yet gone too granular on the video side. Okay, so I haven't gone granular, but it seems to me recording in 4K like you would on any other previous smartphone. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Switching into 8K, which I would think to the average consumer and even to me 
going from 4K to 8K recording should result in something that is a marked improvement, higher quality. Sure. But what I'm seeing here, and I haven't watched the clips back, I do have an 8K TV, Samsung TV, so I can watch in full resolution anything I record. It should be said the phone's display is not 8K. Your computer monitor is likely not 8K. Your tablet's not 8K. So if you're watching content that people are saying they recorded in 8K on a Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, if you're not watching it in 8K, you're not seeing an 8K picture. But sure. this is weird. And I don't, I don't know if you know anything about this. Maybe I just don't understand cameras. <laughs> when you shoot in 4K, you have a much wider field of view than when you shoot in 8K. When you swap into 8K mode, it's almost like you've gone 2X. Yeah. And you lose a lot of the picture that you were video recording. My expectation was that it would be the same or wider in 8K mode rather than being cropped in so much. So it was almost like a disappointment that I couldn't get the shots I wanted to get. If I wanted to get these great shots of like a sunset, for example, or something, I'd have to like run back like 50 feet from where I was standing or yeah. switch over to 4K mode. You know, I'm testing it right now while you're talking. I switched on over to 8K. Okay. Uh, and it's interesting. It, it, you're right. It's so hard to really see what the 8K images actually look like because most of the time you're not viewing this really in 8K. Right. So you're looking at high resolution footage that's been scaled down. It's yeah. You know, may, maybe not so accurate, right? Correct. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't know how to answer that question. That's but you see like the crop. a very good... Yeah, but it also might be the aspect ratio, right? So it's what, 16 by 9 in 8K? And both. You know, or maybe it's 4 by 3 in 4K? No, it's 16 Not, by 9 in mean, both. That seems odd. It should just be more pixels on that same, exactly. that same image. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. I wasn't... And I, when I was doing this, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Am I just missing yeah. something that everybody knows? But... This is one of those things, and this is just one tiny feature of the phone, by the way, so I'm not like slamming the phone. Yeah. But I feel like this is one of those things that going back to, you know, Samsung putting things out there, Apple putting things out there, this is obviously the cute Qualcomm, Qualcomm feature too. Yeah. I feel like if and when Apple adds something like 4K or 8K to the iPhone, it's going to be done in a way that it's the same or better, not something that when you switch into the mode, you're like, wait a minute, what's this? Why is this weird? What's going on? And 8K recording on the S20 Ultra at 10 megabits per second, which is a it's a low bit rate, seems to be underwhelming. But again, that's 8K video. If you have no way to watch 8K video, I don't even know why you'd record in 8K. Why? Just record in 4K. And when you record in 4K, it looks beautiful. I mean, you're not wrong. Although, you know, being on the Android world, I do kind of think like, well, we don't know what Apple's going to do. You can't give them credit for something they haven't done yet, right? Right. I mean, you know, looking to the past, like we've seen features added to other devices that compete with Apple a lot of times in janky ways. And then people are like, why doesn't Apple add this? Android has this. And then eventually a year or two later, Apple adds it and it's done in a, an elegant way. And so 8k, like this is really my only major complaint right now with this phone, by the way, the 8k kind of feels like tacked on, like was forced into there rather than being a more elegant way of adding it for lack of a better term. I mean, the the 8K, so the recording's at a, at a chipset level, right? It's being enabled by the Snapdragon 865. So it's yes. at like a very, I mean, it, it's not added on. Like it's, that's as deep as it can go. It's in there, but it's, it's not, I just, it's, it's not what I was expecting. Let's put it like that. Okay. And I think as you I mean, try that, that, it. That's fair. Yeah. It's just not what I was expecting. But moving on from 8K, because that was, that's really the, all again, the only complaint I have. Unless you want to talk about the size. It's a big phone, but there's a lot of power here. And there's a lot of power. It's nice. So what have you been, how have you been testing it for the okay. past day? So I want to talk camera, right? Okay. Everybody, and I did it. Every viewer is like, here's my zoom at whatever, right. five, 10, 50, and a hundred. And then the hundred looks like pixelated kind of garbagey. <laughs> yeah. And then the comments are, oh, that looks horrible. It looks like an oil painting, blah, blah, blah. Listen, yes, it doesn't look like a super crisp shop hundred times zoom. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But I think the expectation for what this can do is totally skewed. And obviously for the price of the phone, there's a certain level of quality. But I think what's interesting is, yes, you can go to 100 times. I don't think anybody should go to 100 times. And I'm sure Samsung can advertise capabilities to do so. Right. But where the sweet spot is, is, is 50 times zoom, 40, 30, where you get these images that look surprisingly good. that are kind of that hybrid zoom of optical and digital. And I think that's where the power behind the camera is. Going to 100 is mostly just a marketing like ploy, like look what we can do. 
But the fact right. that it has that ability and it's got that 108 megapixels, you can take 108 megapixel shots. There's a lot of detail there. And I think it's thus far very impressive on the camera side. Yes. Next what you said earlier about it being a new generation of devices, I agree with that statement. This does feel like a new generation. And this is sort of the entry level now for this new generation is this amazing quality of still. And I think video too, you know, where Android has been deficient right. compared to Apple is on the video side. And so I think this is where we see that sea change in this generation of devices. Yeah. And if you take AK away, the complaint I started with, which maybe I shouldn't have even started with a negative, but if you take AK away and you just shoot in 4K, like it's night and day from what you would expect from Android and those deficiencies. Those deficiencies are pretty much gone. The 4K yeah. video looks fantastic. I would not mind. So one thing that a lot of us talk about in, a, in the industry that we do is how you go to these events and you're mobile and sometimes you have to take out your iPhone to get some shots. And what a lot of oh, people yeah. will say is, you know what, I take my iPhone out, I get my shots, I use B-roll, no one says a word, they can't even tell the difference. You could not do that with Android devices. And now I feel like I can go to an event. I can take out my S20 Ultra. I can record video. No one would know the difference. Yeah, I think that's true. And for the first time, I think that is a true statement. You know, when we went to the S20 event, we went to Unpacked. I was on the Pixel 4 XL, my phone of choice. Yeah. But I brought an iPhone 11 Pro to shoot video on because it did just the difference was that drastic. Right. I don't have to do that anymore. And that is a very big deal. Mm -hmm, I agree. It should be stated that you mentioned like no one needs to like the 100 X zoom is almost like a party trick, but yeah, 30 X zoom on the ultra and 10 X zoom on the S 20 and S 20 plus that's optical zoom. You're not using any digital zoom tricks at all. You're getting a full on nice optical zoom. And that's crazy. 30 X in totally a smartphone crazy. is crazy. It looks great. The other part though, that I think people should know is when you're zooming, if you're not at 1x or 30x on the ultra and 10x mm -hmm. on the non ultras, then you are in digital zoom. So even if you're at, let's just Correct. say 15x, you are then at digital zoom. It's 1x and 30x that would be the two optical zoom and anything in between or higher would be digital. That's a big deal, I think. Yeah. Now, aside from camera, which sounds like we both agree is incredible. Yes, absolutely incredible. And again, when I say next gen, that includes, you know, I'm an iPhone user, you know, day by day, my main phone, but the iPhone camera on the current iPhone 11, iPhone 11 Pro, I'm considering that last gen. Like Samsung is the first phone to have this next generation style camera. And we have to see how Apple responds later this year. And as you mentioned, a lot of the other flagship Android devices coming this year are going to mimic. They're going to mimic what Samsung's done here. So it's not like Samsung is, you know, at the top of everybody, but certainly with what Qualcomm released in their latest Snapdragon 865, Apple is in the position to play catch up. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fair, a fair point. Yeah. Moving away from camera though, how do you feel about the size of this device? Carrying it in your pocket, bring it around. It, it's dense. It's heavy. Yeah. I came away from the event thinking like, holy crap, this is a gigantic <laughs> phone. And I think what people don't realize is we've had big phones before. This is a thick boy. I mean, the camera sensors are yep. gigantic in it first off, but also it's got a 5,000 million power battery. So right. it's a big, right. it's a big phone. But, you know, I put my SIM in it after I had been playing with the Galaxy Fold for a couple hours. So it surprisingly felt felt uh, <laughs> to me. <laughs> But it is it is a big phone. And I think what's kind of going under the radar with everything, especially with the Ultra, you know, the 120 hertz and FHD and then, you know, rumors that the 120 hertz will come to other screen resolutions. Mm, I, didn't I don't live much. in a 5G area. So okay. I'm on Verizon. There's very sporadic millimeter wave 5G yes. in Southern California. I mean, it's like you walk a, a street and you're away from it. So for all intents and purposes, 5G has no impact on my battery. Okay. But if I take this phone with a 5,000 million power battery, and I'm traveling. And you know that pain of when you're traveling and you want to maintain your battery life. You've got battery packs just in case. Yeah. I put that screen resolution at HD plus and my refresh rate at 60 hertz. A 5,000 milliamp hour battery is a battery king. And I'm not saying this is something you do every day. You should take advantage of that power of the screen refresh. But when you need a phone that can last you that extra six hours while you're on the road, yep. it's going to be hard to beat the Ultra. I agree. And I'm really excited to test that. 
I agree. Now, this phone does start at fourteen hundred dollars. So, yes, it's about nineteen dollars more than the Z Flip that we just talked about. We got to talk about pricing here. Yeah. A couple of years ago, when Apple released the iPhone 10 at the top of the line, alongside the eight and eight plus people were livid that Apple would even dare to launch a phone at a thousand dollars. Livid. How this is the Apple tax and no one else is doing this. Fast forward to today, the low end S20, not plus, not ultra, just the standard S20 starts at $999. The plus is $1199. And then the ultra $1399 to start for 128 gigs and then goes up to $1799. If you want the 512 gigabyte version, like this phone costs what a laptop would cost you. A nice laptop would cost you a very nice laptop. What do you think about that? Like, are we going to be seeing and to be fair, by the way, to be fair, I don't have a problem with any of these prices, even if it was something I couldn't afford, like make great devices. And if they have to be priced where they need to be priced, understandable, because in this day and age, We're in an age where the smartphone is your main computing device. There was an age in the past where your laptop was your main computing device or your desktop was Mm -hmm. your main computing device. People use their smartphones more than any other piece of tech that they own. And as such, I don't have a problem with packing all the tech you can into these little devices and pricing them accordingly. But do you think we're going to be seeing a lot of people buying the Ultra in particular? This is the one that is the tech, you know, It's packed with every feature that Samsung has. How many people are going to get to use it and enjoy it? I mean, so I flip-flopped on this one and I did a complete 180. I was was talking to uh, Matt Gonzalez, one of the guys that I I film with, and I was saying, like, how can Samsung charge these prices for phones? Like, that's crazy, $1,400. Uh And he asked me a very simple question. He said, how many times a day do you look at your phone? I was like, I don't know, probably a lot. (laughs) And he goes, what are you using for your daily information and your daily communication device more than anything right. else. I was like, well, my phone. He's like, so if you're going to pay expensive prices for anything in your life, shouldn't it be what you're using the most? And I was like, well, all right. I guess I could see that. I agree with that. So I was like, I, I didn't think of it like that. I'm like, that's just an asinine price. I can get a phones for much less. But if I'm going to make the decision to get the best of what I'm using all the time, then okay. I can wrap my head around that price now where I couldn't before. And sure, people are going to disagree with that because it's still a ask that amount of money. Absolutely. But if you are going to spend that money, I guess it would make sense to spend it on a device that you're going to be using way more than you probably should per day. For hours per day. Like the one thing that this is similar to in a way is, you know, when I first started my business and working from home and out of my home office and I was looking at chairs and I was shocked that there were office chairs that would cost a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. It's like, what is this? You can buy a chair at Staples for $35. This is insane. And then I thought about it and it was like, I'm going to be spending seven, eight hours a day sitting in this chair for how many years? You might as well put money into the things that you're going to use most so you get the most out of them. And I feel like that's the same with smartphones, you know, these days. Yeah, I think that's a fair point and a very appropriate point. So final thought, well, not final. Uh, We've only had these phones for a day. but. After a day of usage, uh, before we move on to our, our final topic in the show, I've got to say, man, Samsung really knocked it out of the park. I think up next is going to be LG with mm-hmm. what, what they're coming out with next. And like, as you said earlier, we can expect to see probably a very similar device to what Samsung has made as far as features and specs go. LG will probably keep the, the headphone port like they're known to do with a DAC. But man, yeah. this year, this is the year to upgrade your phone if you've been waiting, especially on the Android side. There's a lot of power that we're seeing this year that was just missing the past couple of years. I agree. There's a lot of reasons to give Android another look if you haven't in the past. And if you're on the Android side, this may be the year that you can actually say it's worth the upgrade. You know, if, if even if you have the last gen. Right, for sure. All right, final topic of the show. Moving on from Android to Apple. We're going to talk a little bit about the Apple March event. John just did a video on this, what we're going to be expecting, and also how the coronavirus has kind of affected Apple and the consumer electronics industry at large. So let's start with the event. Okay. 
So Apple rumors. They were supposed to have an event in October. At least that was the rumor, right? And we were going to see a bunch of things get announced. That didn't happen. And now we have, again, rumors of this kind of February, March event. And if we Mm -hmm. back up a year ago at the same event, it's where we saw kind of the weird Apple event where they did all the Apple TV stuff and also announced the Apple card. Services. It was a services event. Services event, mostly. There are a lot of things on the docket that I think we're going to see from Apple. And start with the big one iPhone SE2, iPhone 9, whatever they call it, Mm -hmm. a new phone with allegedly a starting price point of $399 in the body of an iPhone 8 with the specs Mm -hmm. of an iPhone 11. So A13, three gigabytes of RAM, an asinine starting storage of 64 gigabytes. And of course, we'll have Touch ID instead of Face ID built in. Yeah. One camera. It'll be the 12 megapixel wide. It's a very good sensor. It'll, it'll enable kind of flagship level features like night mode, HDR, and video, and sort of Apple's really good stabilization. Nothing too exciting, I don't think, on that front. It's a really low price point, and it's the cheapest way to get a new iPhone, and it keeps Touch ID around for another generation. So I'm sure they will sell like crazy, much like the previous iPhone SE. Yeah. Sold like crazy, right? Yep. There's not too much to dissect here about this phone. I think Apple has done this in the past. They pick a body style from generations old that already has recouped all of its R&D costs. They use it again, so there's no additional R&D development. They put in different specs, they package it up, and they say thank you very much. Yeah, and in this case, though, I think there's a, a second story, which is there's a lot of people who I've seen, especially like if they're older, they don't want to get rid of their home button. They're holding on to their phones because they might want a new phone, but they don't want to learn new gestures and a new interface. And so... Here's an opportunity to get new specs, faster phone, better camera and all this while still maintaining that comfort level. I don't think you're wrong. I mean, I can give a personal example. My dad was holding onto his iPhone success for dear life because he did not want to get rid of his home button. Oh, really? He just didn't want anything new. I had an older iPhone 10 and I was like, listen, you can buy yourself a new phone and pay for it yourself or you can have an iPhone 10 that I will just give you. And he's like, well, okay, I'll take a free phone. Uh, <laughs> so he used it. And now he loves Face ID. He's like, I don't think about it anymore. Yeah. And his thumbprint very rarely worked with, with Touch ID. So he's always putting in his passcode. So maybe it's an instance that people just need to try it. And there's a longer discussion about the generational life of iPhone. So the first mm-hmm. life that it has from the first owner, second and third life these phones have when they get sort of traded back into Apple and they go to emerging markets. Right. And that sort of keeps this alive a lot longer. So that's another discussion maybe for another episode. But sure. iPhone 9, not many giant surprises there. Some other interesting rumors. There's Apple AirTag, similar to Tile. It has been kicking mm-hmm. around since last year. We expected to see it in time for Christmas 2019. It didn't happen. Apple's Tags. It works with the Find My app on your phone. You can find whatever you have that Tile attached to or inside of. Yeah. It's pretty self-explanatory and, and not too surprising. What is interesting is rumors of an Apple wireless charger. And certainly that harkens us back to air power, right? Right, of course. A pretty widespread failure. So why would Apple put themselves on the line again and sort of bring up the very fresh memory of AirPower. And the rumor goes that this is not as fully featured as AirPower, but it is a wireless charger from Apple. Yeah. On the surface, I can't see this making that much sense. There's a ton of wireless chargers that let you charge an Apple Watch and a phone or something else via cheese from every other manufacturer. The only way I can see this making sense is an incremental step. As we sort of get to what appears what Apple wants is a portless phone. Apple yeah. will need a first party charger for sure. And if this first party charger is akin to, let's say, the first generation Galaxy Fold. You got to get to Gen two or three. Then, OK, it makes sense. Right. Just just right right now. It's just a, a cheap compatible charger with probably a magnet for your watch. I agree. Weirder rumors of an AirPods Pro Lite. Yes. Which I can't assume is going to be the name. No. But Apple does like to do very confusing things with their lineups. Think no farther <laughs> than MacBook, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, iPad, iPad, or iPad Pro, where it doesn't make sense to have so many devices that appear so similar. I think what this AirPods Pro Lite is, is just AirPods 3. First generation AirPods go away. You've got this new third gen that looks probably like the same two. Better battery life, perhaps some more drivers built inside and better speakers. Wireless charging case standard and you call it a day. Yeah, I agree, I agree completely with that. When I saw AirPods Pro Lite, I was thinking this probably just lost in translation. They're not going to have AirPods and then AirPods Pro and then something in the middle. Like there's not enough feature disparity to have a third option. If anything, maybe they settle on the AirPods Pro form factor going forward for both models. But I don't even know if I'd go that far. I think it's just here's what the third generation of non-pro AirPods 
is going to be. Yeah, I think so as well. Other rumors, Apple first party over the ear headphones, which certainly they've got those with Beats, but these will be Apple branded with all sort of the AirPod esque features for easy pairing, noise canceling, essentially, at least appears to be to sort of rebrand the Beats with an Apple logo on it. We've been hearing grumblings of those for a while. Mm hmm. And then last, and this is just only a matter of time, not if, is a new 14-inch Mac Pro replacing the 13 with the yes. butterfly switches built in, 10th gen Intel processors. I am hopeful, and this is nothing based on rumors, I'm just crossing my fingers and my toes, that we get a 14-inch MacBook Pro with a dedicated GPU option. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Would be amazing. And that, I think, is shaping up to be a pretty nice event. Obviously, other things could happen, like a new iPad Pro, which hasn't been updated since the 2018 iPad Pro. It's time. With with time, you know, better cameras on there, which who cares, better processor, which processor is already really good in the iPad Pro, time of flight sensor on there, new keyboard accessories with backlighting. Hold on a second. You know, and Hold on. Hold on a second. Okay. Mr. Rettinger. Okay. How come with foldables... You're excited about the new hardware and what it can enable. Mm -hmm. But with the iPad Pro, you're like, yeah, who cares? New processor. No big no, deal. I think, I think I'm like that. I think I'm like that because my iPad Pro, my 2018 iPad Pro, I've got the big one. It's probably my favorite device, a piece of tech I've ever owned. Okay. I think it's so close to perfect. That's high praise. I mean, I think it really is high praise. It's so close to perfect. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It'll be a little bit faster. Like it's already <laughs> suits. It's already so good. It's not discounting the next generation. I think it's just more giving praise to how really good the iPad Pro is. If anything, give me better battery life and I'm fine. Gotcha, I gotcha. use it so much. Okay. So there, maybe I should, I should have explained it a little bit better. That's fair. That's like the wild card though, right? Like the iPad Pro, because I've been hearing rumors that it's going to come at the end of the year. And I've been hearing rumors that it's going to come at the March event. They've always had the Pro on a, like an 18 month cycle, which would mean that it's time now for it to come. Yes. However, if it's an 18 month cycle continuing, do you launch the iPad Pro now without 5G and then wait 18 months to put 5G into the iPad Pro or do you launch it now with 5G or what do you think about that? Like that that's the one wild card for me where I'm not sure what they're going to do. Yeah, I don't know. I think it'd be hard to see 5G coming to iPads before iPhones. Right. But who knows? Like the current iPad Pro doesn't have Wi-Fi 6. Whereas the iPhone does, so that's an that's instance true. where we could see things. I don't think Apple is jumping on 5G and until next year. I think the hardware is finally ready for it. You know, we've got modems that can do millimeter wave and sub six. Yep. The S20 is kind of the first widely available line of phones that are unlocked for 5G support on any carrier across the US with the exception of the regular S20 only mm -hmm. supporting millimeter wave. I don't know. I'm, I don't think 5G people really give two craps about 5G until they have it where they live. And until it's hitting 80% of Makes sense. America. Yeah. So I, I doubt that, but I've certainly been wrong in the past. Okay. So let's talk about how the coronavirus, which is obviously you can't go a day without hearing about the coronavirus spreading what it's doing. I wish I could. Thanks for ruining it for me. <laughs> well, listen, in the industry that we work in, the coronavirus has had some pretty interesting and major effects. And so I actually compiled three areas where we're seeing the coronavirus affect us. And it's not even something where it's just affecting, you know, things in China, but how it actually may affect you as the listener later this year. So first is store and office closures. So over in Asia, especially in China, we're seeing Apple, Samsung, Microsoft, Tesla, Google, and now also Amazon that have closed retail stores and office buildings in that area, which means that planning for future devices is slowing and sales of devices is slowing. So we're seeing stock prices being affected. Obviously, this one isn't really affecting the average consumer in America, but still something to be aware of. Second is the event shakeups. So things like Mobile World Congress just canceled. This is the largest annual event conference where basically every phone manufacturer, with the exception of Apple, appears at Mobile World Congress to talk about what's coming that year. It's basically CES for smartphones, and that's canceled. Yeah. PlayStation, Oculus, and Facebook Gaming have all pulled out of the Game Developer Conference, which is another huge, it's a huge event 
for the gaming world. Sony is skipping PAX East. Huawei has postponed their February developer conference. League of Legends, there's a, they have this huge tournament every year. It's indefinitely delayed. Overwatch League, PUBG events also postponed. So a lot of major companies and events, events are being canceled. Companies are pulling out of events that aren't being canceled. And so the news of new devices is even being affected. Things that we would have learned about, we would have gotten a bunch of new hot topics to talk about during Mobile World Congress that companies now have to plan alternates for. Now, the last one and the biggest one and the one that will affect the average consumer the most is launch delays and product shortages. So the fact is that lots of factories in China are currently shut down and have been shut down for at least a couple of weeks. And so what does this mean? What we're seeing is even today, right now, if you want to order AirPods from Apple, you have over a one month wait for them to arrive. If you want to order an iPhone, we're starting to see delays in iPhone. You're not just seeing the ships in 24 hours, ships in 48 hours. You're seeing these things are going to take a week or more to get to you. Facebook stopped taking orders for the Oculus Quest, which has been out for months, almost a year due to coronavirus related issues. So if you want to order an Oculus Quest from Facebook or from Oculus, you just can't. There's no buy button right now. Asus, the ro- well, how do you call it? Is it the ROG phone, the ROG phone? Yep, Republic of Gaming. How do you pronounce this though? The ROG phone. The ROG phone. Okay. The ROG phone 2 is unavailable until further notice, <laughs> according to Asus. Again, because of the coronavirus. Tesla has postponed some Model 3 deliveries because of issues at the Shanghai factory and the coronavirus and Nintendo Switch consoles and games are seeing delays as well. Apple, just a few days ago on the 17th, warned that revenue for the quarter will be lower than they anticipated. And Apple is generally very conservative when they give quarterly guidance. So they're saying they're even going to miss that conservative guidance because of coronavirus's impact on the iPhone supply and reduced retail traffic in China. So this is actually a big deal, a bigger deal than I expected it to be. Yeah, it, I mean, it certainly is a, a big deal. It's certainly a bigger deal for people who are affected by coronavirus. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Of course. Then maybe those of us who are inconvenienced by it. But it, it certainly is impacting a global supply chain and maybe illustrates the reliance of the global economy on Chinese manufacturing. Yes. I don't know what we do about that. I mean, China is where, as Tim Cook said a couple of years ago, they just can't find that level of skill in manufacturing anywhere else. Yeah. At that scale. So I'm curious what this means for things like the next iPhone, for example, because these devices or even the iPhone 9, which is obviously a much sooner product, these devices have to be coming off of the assembly line, you know, quickly and without at a regular pace, basically all year. If you want iPhones to ship you know, worldwide, they just need to be coming off the assembly line day by day by day. Any breaks in that can cause massive delays the world over. But the problem is when you have a new product like an iPhone 9 or the upcoming, I don't know, 11S, 12, whatever that's going to be, manufacturing doesn't start the day that they announce the phone. They've been manufacturing those things for a couple of months by that time. And so we may be seeing a world where Apple either announces these things on their normal schedule, but they're super hard to get, or Apple delays announcements or Apple event. I mean, we just talked about several events being canceled. Might Apple have to change up WWDC or iPhone announcements or anything like that? So, Mr. Edwards, I want to hearken back to your previous comments about the Galaxy Z Flip and what is Samsung trying to hide by only giving us access to these devices for uh, 24 hours. Yeah. I think we see exactly what they're trying to hide. They don't have inventory of it, probably due to coronavirus hurting manufacturing. Mm, Good point. I think we will see inventory constraints, especially if this iPhone 9 does does happen, because presumably that manufacturing would have taken place pretty aggressively over the past four to six weeks. I don't think it'll have any material impact, though, on the iPhone 11S, iPhone 12, whatever comes in September. But I do think we will see some sort of impact on this next gen phone. And that may be a reason why it wasn't announced earlier and perhaps a reason why it's not announced at a March event and why we we don't have a March event until they can ship these devices. This is a mass market device. They can't ship them in mass quantities. What's the point? I agree. 
Very interesting. This whole thing, obviously, like you said, the, the most important part are the people who are directly affected, whether you're sick or have sick family members, but also interesting taking a macro look at how something like this in the right area of the world can affect availability and product you know, the world over. It's crazy. Agreed. And that is it for this edition of Geared Up. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can catch John and I on YouTube. I'm at youtube.com slash gear live. And John is at youtube.com slash John for Lakers. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on all the latest tech. Speaking of subscribing, you can subscribe to Geared Up in your favorite podcast app if you haven't done so already. Just search Geared Up. That's two words, not one in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcast, or really wherever you choose to listen. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Geared Up is a Gear Live podcast, and you can see more from us at GearLive.com. Thank you so much for listening. For John Rettinger, I'm Andrew Edwards, and we'll catch you in the next episode.